pleasure and privilege to be here at St. Charles Community College, so thank you very much for inviting me. Let me start this by giving you all a little bit of background on myself to understand where I'm coming from and why I've done some of the things that I've done. I'm 49 years old, but I grew up as the child of parents in the foreign service. So we were assigned to various countries overseas. And between traveling with my parents and traveling today as a professional musician with my own band and various other bands around this country and around the world, I have been in 50 different countries on five continents. So I have absorbed literally hundreds of different cultures, religions, races, ethnicities, etc., and that has shaped who I am today. One of the first times that when I was going to school overseas, back in the you know grade school, back in the early 60s, my classes were filled with Nigerians, Italians, Germans, Japanese, French, you name it. If they had an embassy in those countries, all their kids went to the same school. And that's how I grew up. But at the same time, back home here, in my own country, the United States, my peers were going to either newly integrated schools or still segregated ones. And it was not the diversity in the classroom that we have today that I was experiencing overseas. The first time I experienced racism was one time when I came back home after the assignment with my parents. And I was 10 years old in the fourth grade. We were living in Belmont, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. And I was one of two black kids in the entire school, myself in fourth grade and a little girl in uh, second grade. And my, my friends were all white. And the guy friends of mine were members of the Cub Scouts. And they had invited me to join the Scouts. So I joined the Cub Scouts. And on Scout Day, we had a march from Lexington to Concord, Massachusetts, to commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. I was the only black scout in this march of Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, and Brownies. And somewhere down the parade route as I'm marching with my fellow scouts, I began getting hit by bottles and pebbles and you know, debris from the street by spectators over on the sidewalk. And me being naive and never having experienced this kind of thing before, I thought, you know, that the people over here on the sidewalk didn't like the scouts. I did not realize that I was the only scout getting hit until my dead mother and my club master came back in the line and huddled over me with their bodies and escorted me out of danger. And I kept saying, why? Why are they hitting me? Why are they hitting me? And they would say, shh, just move along, girl. hurry up, move along. You know, it'll be okay. They never answered my question. When I got home, my mom and dad, who were not at the march, you know, were cleaning me up, putting mercurial chrome on me and band-aids, and asking me, what happened to you? Did you fall down? How'd you scrape up your face? Well, I told them. My parents sat me down and told me why I was being hit. And I'll tell you right now, I was 10 years old. I thought my parents were lying to me. I did not believe them. Because it was incomprehensible to me that someone who had never laid eyes on me, never spoken to me, knew absolutely nothing about me, would want to inflict pain upon me for no other reason than the color of my skin. It made no sense. And these kids and their parents over here on the sidewalk who were throwing things at me did not look any different to me than my white friends in my class or my white friends overseas, whether they were my fellow Americans or little French kids or Danish kids or German kids or whatever. And they all treated me fine and so did their parents. So race was not the, the, uh, the answer. My parents were wrong. Well, more and more things began happening that I didn't understand, but I realized that my parents were right. It had something to do with the color of my skin. I didn't know what. Well, that experience stayed with me. We moved back overseas on another assignment. Everything was normal again. But every time I'd come home, things would happen. So I cataloged all these events in my head. And um, I, went to, uh, I graduated from high school, and I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C., where I graduated with my degree in music. And in 1980, in uh, 1983, I joined a uh, country western band. Country music had gained a resurgence. And um, everybody, all the clubs were turning country. So I joined a country band, and I was the only person, only, only black person in that band, 
and the only black person in most of the places where this band would perform. One place we performed was the truck stop lounge up in Frederick, Maryland. At this little truck stop motel where all these truckers passing through would frequent. You know, you all have that Highway 70 that runs out through this way. It runs right through Frederick, Maryland. And there's a truck stop right there along this lounge. So not that black truckers could not go in there. Black truckers simply chose not to go in there. And usually for good reason, because they did not feel welcome. <laughs> Well, here I was up in there playing this music. And I uh, come off the bandstand with, uh, after, the, after the first set on break, I'm walking to go sit with my bandmates at the table, and this white gentleman gets up from his table, he's probably like in his mid to late 40s like I am now, he gets up from his table and walks across the dance floor and puts his arm around my shoulder. And he says, I really like your almost music. I said, thank you, I appreciate that. He says, you know, I've seen this band before, but I've never seen you before. Where'd you come from? Well, I said, I just joined the band a few months ago. He said, well, man, I really like your piano playing. This is the first time I've ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. How many of you all have heard of Jerry Lee Lewis? OK, for a few of you all who have not, Jerry Lee Lewis is a you know, white rock and roll, rockabilly, boogie woogie piano player. He's still around today. But his heyday was back in the 1950s. And if you don't know the name Jerry Lee Lewis, I'm sure you all have heard the songs, you know, Goodness Gracious, Great Balls of Fire, or a whole lot of shaking going on. If you think about the piano uh, on those records, or those CDs, rather, um, that's Jerry Lee Lewis. That's his piano style. Well, anyway, so the guy says he'd never heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. And I was kind of taken aback. I mean, I wasn't quite sure where he was coming from. I was very naive. <clears throat> and I said, um, well, where do you think Jerry Lee Lewis learned how to play. <laughs> Looks at me and says, what do you mean? And I said, Jerry Lee Lewis learned how to play that style from black blues and boogie woogie piano players. That's where rock and roll and rockabilly came from. Oh, no, 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 no. Jerry Lee had been at that. I said, no, he didn't. Well, we argued back and forth. I told the guy, I was 25 years old at the time, I told the guy, I know Jerry Lee Lewis personally. He's a friend of mine. I've known him since I was 13 years old. And he's told me himself where he learned how to play. I'm telling you, he learned from black blues and, and boogie woogie piano players. But the guy didn't buy it. He didn't even buy that in Jerry Lee. But he wanted to buy me a drink. Now, I don't drink, but I went back to his table to have a Coca-Cola or cranberry juice. He had a buddy sitting there with him. And I met the guy. I sat down. <clears throat> the waitress brought my drink. This guy takes his glass, and he cheers my glass. And he said, you know, this is the first time I ever heard, I, I ever sat down with a black man and had a drink. The first thing that occurs to me is that you know, this guy is having a night of first. Because I could not understand <laughs> how it is that in my 25 years on this earth, I have sat down with literally thousands of white people and had a beverage, had a meal, had a conversation. And this guy is in his 40s. And he's never sat down with somebody else out of his race. You know, where's he been? So I said, why? He didn't say anything. He stared down at the, at the table, just stared at it. I said, why? His buddy said, tell him, tell him, tell him. I said, tell him. <laughs> he looked back up at me just as plain as day and said, straight faced, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, I burst out laughing. I did not believe the guy. <laughs> I had always, I'll tell you, I had always had a fascination with racism ever since that incident that I just told you about in, uh, in Cub Scouts and other subsequent incidents. I had purchased every book I could find that dealt with racism, whether it was black supremacy, white supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan, the Nazis in Germany, the neo-Nazis over here, you name it, I had it, and I've read it all. And in none of my books, does it talk about how a Klansman will come to a black guy and put his arm around his shoulder and praise his piano playing and want to buy him a drink? So I knew that, you know, so something's not right there. So I did not believe the guy. That's why I'm laughing at him. Well, while I'm laughing, he goes inside his pocket, pulls out his wallet, and hands me his Klan card. I looked at this thing. I recognized the Klan logo and everything. And, well, this thing is for real. So I stopped laughing, right? And I gave it back. 
and we discussed the plan and some other things. But um, he gave me his phone number and wanted me to call him any time I was to return to this bar with this band because he wanted to bring his buddies, his buddies, you understand, to come back and see this black guy who played piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. 